Hey everyone, welcome back to Light Inside Cinema. I was thinking about this week and ways to speed up our editing workflow because that's a series that we've been going through, right? And one frustration that I know many editors can relate to is audio because let's just face it, audio is the most crucial part of the entire movie. I mean, your movie might be great, but if your audio is crap, well, your movie is crap. But in order to talk about this today, you know, I'm not the greatest in audio, but I do have something special for you guys. I have our post-production sound supervisor, Stephen Wilson, in the house today. I think that was quite, quite a bit of an introduction there. Oh, we're seeing that. Sound supervisor. This guy has been on basically every film that I've ever done, well, since 2020? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Starting with Shallow Depths. The shallow Depths. Oh, my God. That was a, what, 24 hours? Yeah. No, that was a 48-hour 48 hour 48 hour film festival film for, for your school. <laughs> I thought you were going to kill me after that, but I thought... Was Look, we're still friends. I know, right? We've been friends ever since. So let me ask you, what are the essential steps to set up an efficient audio workflow? We're talking, we're, we're just strictly speaking, post-production. I mean, it really, it really begins, honestly long before, you know, a camera ever is out on set, right? There's conversations that should be happening between your editor and whoever your sound department is, just to understand what software you may be using, whether it's DaVinci, whether it's, you know, Logic or, or whatever. It's, a good, it's good to start having those conversations early so that you know what to expect. You don't want to be caught off guard, you know, in the twenty, you know, the ninth hour or the twenty-third hour or whatever, and and then all of a sudden something doesn't work well with each other, right? I think just to start good conversations and relationships with your team. Have Have you ran into some issues when it comes to the, you know, trying to get the the stuff from the editor and everything? Well, this was all stuff that even you know, I you know, I was I learned just getting out on set. You know, I'm not particular you know i don't know all the cameras that are out there but i'm learning as i see them out you know whether it's a red it's an ari these are all things that i've learned and every camera is a little different right that they have different connections some have eighth inch some have you know four pin limo and all these different connections as a, as a production sound at least or you're just general sound team you need to be prepared for all you know situations so again you're not caught off guard okay so so we did actually run into that problem here with uh, Sweet Secret, right? We didn't have the proper cable for time code. <laughs> because when you don't have scratch audio, you can't do auto syncing in DaVinci Resolve. And I didn't know that, honestly. Yeah. That's, that's something I learned because I'm not an editor. But I, you know, I'd start hearing about, oh, Premiere will auto sync. Oh, okay, so what? We don't need to do Slate anymore? Or what? You know, it's like, but it really needs all that file of scratch audio off your camera. Mm -hmm. To be able to compare the two and go, hey, these belong together, right? It won't, just a slate mark's not enough. You got to have the whole thing. So make sure you come prepared to set. You got a mic for your camera at the very least. So if you have a problem later, it'll sync up. Do you think time code is actually important nowadays? Or do you think that we can get away with just scratch audio? I would say in the independent world, I find that a lot of folks don't use time code only Probably a lot of it is because they just don't know what it is or they're afraid of it. I remember when I was first starting out, it seemed like this time code, like it's some mystery or something. And then once I started using it, I was like, oh, it's actually that simple. Yeah. It's, it's not a complicated thing. It really is all comes back to that conversation that you've had with your editor and your director, right? Like those all y'all need to talk about that prior to um, filming. Because your editor may be totally comfortable by using just, you know, Premiere's auto sync or some feature or syncing to Slate. It really just depends. I think I think that it actually also boils down to who is editing because sometimes 9 out of 10, if there is, you know, a hundred dollar budget film or very minimal, it's normally the director that wrote the film and he's editing right. the project. And I mean, that can come back to where he doesn't really understand when it comes to time code or anything like that and if it's important and especially if you're just starting out so it's just like i mean honestly if you have scratch audio nowadays there is some amazing softwares out there when you agree that can actually help you get the audio synced up 
like DaVinci Resolve itself. I mean, if you come in here, you can actually right click and do an auto sync based on a waveform or by time mm -hmm. code. So yeah, to be honest, uh, it's been quite a few since I've even done video editing it was back in school. And now the software has changed and upgraded so much that it, they now have these auto sync features. So when it came out, I was kind of like, oh, really? I didn't even know about it. So it's a great feature to have. I wouldn't rely on it 100%. Always have that scratch audio. And if you can run time code, I say do it. It's a good experience, especially as a independent filmmaker. You may get on that set or that budget film where they're expecting you to have time code and you don't want to be caught with your pants down and not know what it is at least. Yeah. You know, so get familiar with it. Understand that it's not a scary concept as long as... Your cameras and your slate all have the same time as your recorder. You're good to go. So what are some common mistakes you see beginners make in audio editing and how can they avoid these mistakes? It's a learning process. You know, mono and stereo, I remember when I was first starting out, it seemed like a scary concept because a lot of people look at it like, oh, left and right is stereo. That's not necessarily always true. It, it depends yeah. on how many, how many points of source you have. And so dialogue is always mono. I mean, unless you have, as you're doing something very specific on set and you have two mics at the same time and you're trying to get some kind of stereo spread or something, but typically 99% of the time, your dialogue should be mono. You give him the sound files in mono, he imports them into his session in stereo and exports them in stereo. It's just a pain later for your, your audio editor to try to have to reconvert that back to mono. When you're setting up your session, we're talking about audio, make sure you set up your session correctly from the beginning. Take your, take a moment, take a beat, double check all your settings. Go through it, make sure it's set in 24, 48, and then, and then your dialogue channels are set to mono. Usually in the track itself is where you can change from mono to stereo. And what we're talking about is the sample rate and the bit depth. It, those settings will all be a little different again, depending on what editing system you're going to. But yes, it should be exported in 2448 mono for dialogue. But it also talk, it also depends on how you're setting up your session. Mm. So there's the beginning stages. Make sure your session is set up. And then again, on the back end, after you've already synced audio, right? And everything's kind of edited together, how you're going to export that now to your sound team. All right. Because you could easily change the export setting back to 44.1. Yeah. So, but just keep it in 24.48. Double check that your tracks are all in mono for the dialogue. Now, you may have done some music stuff there. The director may have come in and put in some sound effects prior to you giving it to the sound team. Those tracks would be in stereo. Okay. So you can have different tracks. You can have mono tracks. You can have stereo tracks, right? Yeah. But your stems will be exported the way they were created. When you send that to me, you're sending me that track. I'll, I only have obviously one source, but it'll only be on one channel. It'll be on the left side. Mm -hmm. So if I listen to it, I'm only hearing dialogue in one of my ears. Yeah. Well, I can't export it that way. So I have to figure out how to take that stereo file you sent me and put that back into a center channel. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a pain on logic. I've actually figured it out now. I've gotten better at it, but yeah. It's yeah. just an extra step that your sound you don't want your sound team wasting time having to do so yeah. that there's that one and then obviously like we talked about 48k make sure everything is consistent and then obviously the big big one file management so hopefully your editor your video editor is gonna label things he's gonna have you know characters all on one track so when you receive it and the sound team receives it oh i can see bob he's on track one <laughs> lisa's on track two right yeah. Now, from an audio standpoint, the reason we like it that way is because everybody's voice is different. Everybody's going to receive a different EQ. And even then, I'll have multiple tracks for the same character because depending on what room they're in or what environment they're in, right? Yeah. So it's going to receive a different EQ. They were outside for this scene. Now they're inside somewhere else. So I'm going to put them on a different track so I can give them a different EQ. If anybody that's edited for any length of time knows this, that, yeah, yeah you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot and you're just going to... You're going to end up creating a bad relationship with your sound department. You know, like you and me, we're friends, so we work through it. But if you're on any kind of mid-budget, you know, maybe you get a contract for a commercial or whatever as a sound person. And, you know, you don't want to have, you don't want to start off, right? 
Yeah. You know, or let's say you're editing in DaVinci, you're the video editor, right? Because that's what we're talking about today. How to deliver, how your deliverables should go to your sound department. Well, you don't want to be handing those off. Let's say you have to hire somebody. It's not your buddy. Yeah. Now you got to call somebody and then they're, you know, a company. Well, you don't want to be handing your project over and it's just all over the map. They'll never hire you again. Yeah. So keep everything organized, keep it clean. And then the extra files, you know, make sure they're labeled so they know what it is and have those conversations early so that everybody knows what to expect. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, and you can do all your audio post-production editing in DaVinci Resolve if you're, you know, the solo team, they have that fair light, which I spoke to you guys recently on and it's getting better, I would say. It has, I have personally not used it, but, but you I, showed a little bit to me. I mean, it, it it can do the job, and it does have some very neat effects and features that you can use to make it work for you for what you're needing to do. Now, I know that a lot of big-time movie productions, they use Avid Pro Tools, but you're using Logic, and I think that's... And I really do feel like it just comes down to a preference, you know, versus what everyone else is using, you know? Yeah, no. I mean, obviously, Hollywood uses Pro Tools. If you're going to be any kind of serious sound editor in post-production, you should know Pro Tools. Yeah. But I prefer Logic just because I've, I've been in the Apple family for so long. I love the way Logic looks. It's easy to see. It's user-friendly. And that's another point to if I can plug Logic a little bit, which I'm not. Right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, for the 200 or so dollars you pay for Logic, you get so much, uh, you know, with Logic. You not only get the wonderful software, you also get all the loops and music stuff. I mean, Logic is known for music production, but it does just standard audio editing just fine. Yeah, but one thing that I, I, I've i dabbled in it, so I, I have Logic myself, but you know, one thing I've found on Logic is that you can't really find as many plugins as, you know, as Pro Tools or Maybe that yeah, might be true, yeah. Because Cubase, I mean, you could get all kinds of wide arrays of plugins mm -hmm. and same with Pro Tools, but Logic, I feel like it's limited. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I haven't delved into the world of plugins too much. I use a lot of Logic stock I do have isotopes stuff, and that's about it, because I pretty much stick to the basics. When it comes to film editing, it's, it's, it's EQ, you know, and cleanup. When I'm receiving, let's say for Race Against Time, for example, I'm receiving everything already in a timeline from what the editor has chose to put into the film, right? Right. Those, those clips I'm expecting to be labeled at least with some kind of character name or scene number, right? Right. So as I'm editing, Logic is already putting stuff in folders for me. But if I see something that is not labeled, I'll go ahead and label it. A lot of times I'll read, I'll relabel stuff by name. I try to color code everything in the session so I know dialogue is maybe green, you know, Foley is orange, you know. So I keep things organized that way. And then Later down the run, as I, as I kind of started to get dialogue all cleaned up, I may run through Logic's cleanup process and, and just make sure it's not, there's not an excessive amount of files that don't need to be there. Yeah. Just so I'm not bogging down the system. Now, also, and we talked about this recently, it's a good habit to get into for the picture editor to be burning in time code in the frame. That helps the sound team later in situations like that where, oh, this is out of sync, but I have a time a time reference, so it, it just makes workflow a little better. When it comes to delivering your video and your audio to your audio supervisor or your editor, you know, a lot of times they would want something called time code burnt into the video, and it makes it easier for our audio editors when they have the time code burned in. And you can actually do this so simply in DaVinci Resolve so what we're going to do is that we're going to go into workspace. We'll go into data burn in. We'll come in here and we'll click on source time code. Now you could change the different fonts that you want right now. You see it right over here. It's very, very tiny, but we can make it bigger. And you, you really want to try to keep it up here in the right corner or in the left corner, just something that's going to be out of the way from where the people were talking. Right? Exactly. You don't want to block in anybody's mouths. <laughs> 
I won't be able to sink anything then. No, unless they're right. cussing and stuff, and they could be like a funny <laughs> yeah, sensor. right? Bleep. But when, yeah. when we have this, you could change the font, you could change the positioning of where you want it, you could change the background opacity, so you don't have to have that big black box on there as well. And, you know, just find a good place that, you know, the audio editor is going to be happy with. And then uh, I think to leading into our next point, because we were dealing with this recently, was just what kind of video format is going to be good for your audio team, depending, again, on what DAW you're using. Yeah. And we found that Logic, just like QuickTime 720, seemed to work pretty good for me. You can keep playing with that depending on, you know, but the, le the less file size you have, the better your system's gonna run. Yeah, you don't need to send your full resolution 4K footage to the sound editor. They will not like you guys on this. No, and a lot of us are not, we're not running on huge computers here. You know, I've got a little Mac mini in there chugging along, but it does fine for audio. But yeah, I, we've experienced a few times, we tried to do some different kind of exports and Logic just didn't like it. It was stuttering and doing all sorts of weird things, so. Yeah. Have those conversations early. What are the top priorities for someone doing a quick audio mix and how can they get a solid result? Top priorities. Well, dialogue is king. If you can't hear your actors, then you don't have nothing. So make sure you focus on your dialogue. Keep it organized. To get a solid mix, I would say that. And then start working on your room tone and also your ambient noises. I like to approach it that way. I usually scene by scene. Just so I can also just feel like, okay, something's coming together. Those blank spaces, I, I, no one's going to take a, a movie like that, you know. Make sure you get lots of room tone on set, whoever your, your mixer is. But then, you know, bring it in. And it starts to so kind of gel together, right? Yeah. I can miss out. If I'm on a time restraint, it's like, okay, maybe there's a couple little footsteps or things maybe missing. Probably can pass. But gaps in the audio, that's not going to pass. Yeah. So get your audio cleaned up, EQ it, use programs like Isotope or Adobe to get your dialogue cleaned up. Hopefully you're receiving your dialogue as clean as it can be, but you know, the world isn't perfect. We run into problems from some time to time. So sometimes, yeah. sometimes. one thing I, I feel like that I run into when I come to trying to edit audio is noise that's coming in, you know, like, like. Let's say you have a fan in the room or you have some sort of outside noise, like an air refrigerator or refrigerator. <laughs> it, these things happen when you're on set and you can't control them, you know? So is there any like tips on removing these things in post-production? What would you recommend? I'll be honest with you. Being a sound mixer also, I've learned to compromise. And you're on set and there's a refrigerator or the AC, right? Low production, let's say. Does everybody want to be dying in the sweat? I mean, depending on how loud this AC is, it. I learned this recently. Consistency is far more important than the perfect clean audio. So, for example, if, 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 if we have the AC through the whole scene, nobody's going to notice it. But if it's on and off, then you're going to notice it, <laughs> right? So maybe have that conversation. Is it worth turning this AC off? just because everyone says to do it. Is it gonna speed up the day, right? A lot of, you know, I mean, if you know the script by heart, you know, you can be trying to do this game. Yeah. But if the, your actors are close enough and you can just keep it still, the consistency of audio is far more important than grabbing the perfect audio. Nobody's gonna hear that, that slight, oh, it's not, you know, the sibilance isn't there or something, right? Not, not unless you're a perfectionist like myself. Consistency is most important because it's unforgivable when you're watching a movie if the audio out of sudden changes. We've all heard it when it's come to level, right? All of a sudden it got real loud. You heard that. It's the same is true with, with slight changes in audio, right? Yeah. All of a sudden they sound crisper than they did a second ago because the boom guy, you know, repositioned the microphone. So I would say consistency is very important. What are some great resources or exercises that you can give someone just starting to learn audio editing. Well, I'll be honest, and you know, I'll probably get shot down for this one, but YouTube is amazing. You can learn so much on the web these days. Whether it's true or not, you know, reference it maybe with other experiences, but you can, you can learn a lot from even channels like yourself. Learn your software, 
and know your shortcuts. When somebody's waiting for an edit, like this gentleman actually, but it does help to, to know the shortcuts for your DAW, you know, as much as you can at least. And you can't be just taking the time to go up to the menu and drop down menu every time, right? Uh, I hope you guys got a lot out of this today. Uh, you know, we really thank Steven for coming in here and, you know, joining us on this video today. And if you guys like this kind of content, press the like button, click the subscribe button, and click that bell notification icon for further videos in the editing process. There, all Is it right there? Place. Yeah. You can right there. Right that one. That one. Okay. <laughs> but... Please post your post a comment on any questions that you may have, and you know we would be happy to answer you. Especially if you're just starting out, you know, trying to learn the that'd audio. Right? No, that'd be great. Yeah. I, I would love to read some comments, especially if there's any sound enthusiasts out there. Yeah, that have questions or even um, you know want to chime in on what we talked about today because it, this is a team thing. You know, I want to know what your guys' inputs are because that's going to help us make future videos, especially on topics specifically on issues that you guys are trying to work through. Because I, I'll be honest, I go through a lot of issues, and I'm just talking to you about the problems that I have personally ran into on set and working in post production and. Here he is. We're learning about that. It's all a learning and growing process. But anyway, we really appreciate your time today. We hope you got value out of this video. Practice and create.